Uh, welcome everyone to tonight's presentation from the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. My name is Marisa Gomez and I'm the museum's public programs manager and I'm really grateful uh, to you all for joining us tonight from all over the place um, and especially so for tonight's speaker Kevin Weissman who I'll be introducing shortly but first we do have just a few notes to share. I want to acknowledge that our museum resides on the traditional and unceded territory of the Yupi tribe of the Awaswas Nation Today, these lands are stewarded by the Amamutsin tribal band, whose ancestors were taken to Mission Santa Cruz and Mission San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast. And the Amamutsin are working hard to fulfill their obligation to create or to care for and steward Mother Earth and all living things through relearning efforts and the Amamutsin Land Trust. Um, I also want to make sure to note that we will be communicating with you tonight via the chat. Your mic and your video are disabled. Um, but we would love to still hear from you um, and we will be able to address your comments and questions at the end of the presentation. So just be busy typing throughout. We'd love to, uh, to see what it is that you have to say. Um, also, uh, it's a little bit more fun if everyone changes who they're sending their messages to from the default option for host and panelists to everyone. And if you would like to practice using the chat, you can let us know where you're streaming in from and uh, about a recent animal sighting that you have had. Uh, we've got Dr. J, Jack uh, from Spokane, Washington joining us. John, who saw a Western toad the other night walking from a grassland into an irrigated almond orchard. That sounds lovely. Um, love to see more stories about that. Uh, also, as you may know, tonight's presentation is in support of the museum's 34th annual science illustration exhibit. The Art of Nature, featuring over 30 local artists, including tonight's speaker, Kevin. And as you can see, Kevin's piece uh, in the show, A Mantis from Dwight, was selected as the featured artwork for this year's exhibit. And speaking of Kevin, tonight's speaker, Kevin Weissman, is a professional herpetologist and artist and grew up in the Bay Area. He worked as a scientific illustrator at the Essig Museum of Entomology at UC Berkeley, which, funnily enough, we actually just hosted a program this past weekend with the director of the Essig Museum, um, which I haven't told you yet, Kevin, so small world, world um, but Pete led an insect walk for us last weekend, which was very fun. And uh, while at UC Berkeley, Kevin got his undergraduate degree in integrative biology with the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. He worked for many years at the Department of Herpetology at the California Academy of Sciences, where he is currently a field associate and has spent over 20 years conducting research on foothill yellow-legged frogs, California king snakes, and Sierra garter snakes. And he also leads a four-day field workshop at the Sierra Nevada field campus for San Francisco State University. So, so many interesting things that I can't wait to um, learn more about. And tonight, Kevin's going to be sharing his early inspirations, experiences from the field, and scientific illustrations with us. Um, so at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. There you are. Hello, Kevin. Hi there. Um, yeah, thank you so much for being here. I can't wait uh, to learn more about your illustrious career and experiences in life. It's all so fascinating. Thank you for being here and sharing. Thanks for having me. Um, can you see my screen here? Yeah, we got your um, PowerPoint up and there it is. Yeah, looks great. So um, uh, just I'll do a little reminder that you can leave your questions in the comments and then at the end of Kevin's presentation, I'll, I'll relay them to him. So take it away, Kevin. All righty. Uh, well, thank you, Marissa. And, um, you know, thanks for inviting me to give this talk. And, um, you know, it's, it's really an honor to be part of this um, scientific illustration show and to be the featured artist who's yours. Um, it's really cool. And I... Um, I think what you guys are doing here is at the museum is, is also really cool, you know, bridging science and art and, you know, teaching natural history to the public. It's, it's something that's um, hard to find these days and it's really important, I think. So um, I'm just, I'm really grateful to be in, in the company of all these artists at the show. There's, uh, I believe, 30 of us and um, the show is gonna be up till June 5th. So if any of you are in the Santa Cruz area can, can pop in and see the show. Uh, please do. Um, and appreciate all of you that are online watching this. Um, I know we got people on the East Coast and a bunch of us on the West Coast. 
I think we've even got somebody uh, here from Bali, and uh, I know there's some folks in Texas too. So thanks for your time, and I appreciate you showing up. Um, so what I wanted to do with this talk um, is to share with you some of my early inspirations, um, some of my early mentors in my life. Um, I've been very fortunate to have some really good mentors and also share with you uh, some artwork. Um, also, uh, studies of frogs and snakes from the last two decades. And I want to close with um, some of my art that is inspired by natural history, um, but with the psychedelic twist. So what the heck is natural history? So, you know, when you go into the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History, you're in this, you're in this museum and, and natural history is really, I mean, you can, you can Google the definition, but really what it is, you know, it's the study of all living organisms. And it's, it's also, you know, we're immersed in it. It's like a, it's like a practice really. And what we're doing is we're, it's, it's like an observational science as opposed to an experimental science. So, you know, you might be out just, you know, just somewhere close to you, like, you know, out in your backyard, you're looking at a bird, you're, you're wondering, well, what the heck is that bird doing? Why is he doing this or that? And, um, you know, you might be hiking on a trail near your house and you see this turd lying on the trail and you like, whose turd is this? You look down and you start checking it out and, um, you might find little hairs in there or little beetle shells, who knows, but you're looking for little like patterns in nature. And that's, I think, what natural history is to me. And, um, and I think at the core of it is curiosity. I mean, you can walk down the trail and be in your own head and not look around and you'll, you're going to miss a lot, you know, so it's, it's really important to be curious, ask questions and think about where you're at. What are, you, what are you looking at? Why are you seeing what you're seeing? So I think, you know, natural history um, itself is, is sort of, um, it runs really deep in us, you know, like knowledge of natural history literally meant life or death for us, you know, thousands of years ago, um, even hundreds of years ago before grocery stores were around. You know, we, we had to know what animals were doing what plants, you know, to eat, what, which ones not to eat. Um, and, you know, knowing the seasonal patterns of animals was crucial to our survival. So it's usually through like people close to us um, that we first get introduced to natural history. And, um, you know, it's either a family member or a teacher, something like that. And I've, I've been really lucky to have a lot of mentors in my life um, as far as this goes. And, um, I'd like you to think about your mentors as I'm going through this, you know, what do they introduce you to? And um, I know each of us has those mentors and um, I would just like you to think about yours. Um, so for me, um, it was this man, uh, Uncle Dwight Wiseman. And when I was a little kid, you know, I, I, I didn't know what natural history was or, you know, I, I'm not even sure my uncle did or would even really have used that term, but he, he practiced it, you know? He was always taking us out, catching critters, hunting for cool rocks. You know, he taught me how to camp and fish, got me into scuba diving. And he was really one of the first people around me that got me into nature, you know, paying attention to what was out there, scratching our heads about why this rock was here or, you know, why this snake we found was, was in a certain place. You know, why is a sturgeon's mouth so long? What the heck is that? Why is, why is a sturgeon's mouth long like that? You know, so my uncle asked me to draw him a praying mantis um, a little while ago. And, you know, unfortunately he passed last year and I wasn't able to get him his mantis. So you know, I finally uh, decided to finish it. I wanted to honor him and, and his legacy and ended up entering it for this, uh, this is 34th annual show at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. So I was really happy to um, have his mantis as part of this show. And, you know, Uncle Dwight was really into, um, you know, critters, of course, but also he was really into space exploration. And he would follow all the space shuttle missions, you know, like uh, he even traveled all the way from Washington, all the way to Florida, drove in his truck all the way there just to witness the last space shuttle launch and, 
and return. That was in 2011. So my illustration here is a little bit, um, you know, it's referencing that, you know, this, this mantis, she's like sitting on the side of a, a planet or a moon. And, you know, she's, she's kind of pointing off to this distant star or planet and she's kind of gesturing towards this as if to, you know, for you to go explore it. And that's kind of what, what he, did, he would have done. So I, I entitled this a mantis from the white. So I grew up in Livermore, which is about an hour east of San Francisco. And in my junior high, um, junior year of high school, I was lucky enough to find myself in Roland Carlson's field biology class, which is really cool. I mean, a field biology class in high school is, is a rare thing. And I feel lucky for that. Mr. Carlson was a really great teacher. He would pack us all these crazy kids in a suburban and he'd take us on these day trips to Sonol. Uh, we go on like four day backpacking trips into the Sierra Nevada, places like Tuolumne Meadows, Yosemite, and we go cross country skiing, all these things. And there on the bottom left is a place that he would take us tide pooling. This is in Half Moon Bay. And some of you know this date, October 17th, 1989. He took us out there. All these kids are out there traveling. We're finding octopi and sun stars. We're having a blast. And all of a sudden, the Loma Prieta earthquake hits. And, you know, we had never really experienced a big earthquake up to that point. And here we are with Mr. Carlson. And, and that cliff back there behind the tide pools, that thing, like sheets of those that cliff were just tumbling down multiple times and we just turned around and watched it and you know Mr. Carlson just said well that was an earthquake and we just kept tide pulling after that it was it was pretty cool and you know something I'll never forget but you know I loved going on these field trips with him and I ended up being his TA uh, the following year as a senior and I got to do all those trips over again so one of uh the books that was in his course curriculum was Robert Stebbins' Reptiles and Amphibians of the San Francisco Bay Area. So this book absolutely changed my life. It was the perfect melding of herps and art. And Stebbins was like instantly my hero and immediately went out and bought his 1985 uh, field guide, which is where these illustrations are from. So I, I couldn't stop looking at these. And it was, I, I really loved especially his black and white illustrations. Another required reading uh, were chapters from Stephen Jay Gould's uh, Wonderful Life, The Burgess Shale and the Nature of History. So this book introduced us to evolution and all these really bizarre creatures from the Cambrian explosion, which is like 500 million years ago. So one of the coolest of these was this critter called Hallucigenia. It's hard to say, Hallucigenia. And um, that's the critter right there in the middle, the bottom middle. And these illustrations were done by Marianne Collins in Stephen Jay Gould's book. And um, Hallucigenia is famous for being um, sort of misrepresented initially. It, when it was first um, found, they thought it walked on these spiny legs. And they had a, it had a head on the right side, this big bulbous head, and then had this tubular tail and these big weird appendages on its back. But it turns out as they found more fossils that it actually walked on those tubular legs that were on its back. The spines were actually spines on its back. And that bulbous head was actually just, you know, as the animal was fossilized, it basically evacuated all its gut contents and did like a stain. So that's what showed up on the fossil. And then its mouth was actually that tubular thing on the left side. So, you know, Mr. Carlson had me, you know, take these drawings of Marianne Collins and he asked me to redraw them for him because he needed to use them in his class handouts. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll do it. And I, I didn't really realize it until later what he was really doing. So, you know, when you're young, you emulate your heroes. And I began trying to do these pen and ink illustrations like Stebbins would do or Marianne Collins did. You know, I had tons of, critters at home and terrariums. And one of them was this Argentine horn frog named Tupac. So I drew him and 
uh, through a relative of mine, I made a connection with the Northern California Herb Society and they ended up putting him on the cover, which was really cool for me as a kid. And, uh, you know, the crazy thing is Tupac, I bought this little guy in high school from the East Bay Vivarium. He ended up living 33 years, which turns out to be the longevity record for the species. So I calculated it out. It's like 70% of my life I spent with this frog. So across the quad from Mr. Carlson's class was where I took art from Ms. Myers. She was like a really encouraging teacher. She had this like cool um, open studio in the back of her classroom. So you could go in there almost any time and work on whatever art you were working on. So I worked on um, an oil painting. This was one of my pets also. This is a Chinese water dragon named Dino. So I worked on him for a long time. And another thing that happened around that same period was you guys remember uh, and you'd see these little ads in there of like a pirate or like this turtle and it said draw me so I drew it and you know you send it in and then they would try to sell you this mail order art course and these these two dudes showed up at our house like later and they were trying to sell us this art course and um, you know my mom ended up you know she was always so supportive of my art and having all these critters in her house and um she signed me up for this mail order course, which is really cool. I learned a lot from it. So after high school, I ended up going in the Marine Corps. And that really pissed off Miss Myers, I remember. She wanted me to go to art school. And she said I was ruining my life and all this stuff. And the funny thing was, after I signed up for the Marine Corps, Mr. Carlson, when he found out, he pulled me aside and he said, you know, I was in the Marine Corps also. And that really shocked me because he had never once, you know, all the backpacking we did as kids, he never once mentioned it. And I always thought that was really cool. Um, you know, just giving us sort of our own um, a, a direction, you know, he didn't want to influence us that way. But, um, you know, I celebrated my first, or excuse me, my 18th birthday during the first day of boot camp. And later turns all that, Turns out all that backpacking that we did with Mr. Carlson was like really good preparation for the Marine Corps. So they had just different names for things. Like we weren't backpacking anymore, we were humping. And we also carried rifles around. We didn't do that in Mr. Carlson's class. And we, we go set up a, a bivouac instead of a campsite. So I later went to junior college and then uh, took a field trip to the Cal Academy of Sciences. And I found out they had this herpetology department. So, I started volunteering there and this is what the lab room used to look like when you walk in and you just see like jars and jars and jars of specimens everywhere. So my first job there after a few years was being part of this three person crew here. We were called the minions and we systematically went through the collection and we replaced specimens with these old metal tags that were degrading with new paper ones. So our boss was this uh, bearded fellow up at the top left. This is Jens Vindem. He's the collections manager. So you can see him here. He's like, he's holding my, my newborn son, Gavin, and he's introducing him to his first snake. And this is a, a rubber boa. And I love Gavin's little face there. Um, Jens was a huge mentor to me. And, you know, he taught me how to work hard and you know, play hard. And he, we were always laughing in there about something or other. He was really the heart of that department. So I also worked for this guy at the Cal Academy. This is Joe Slowinski. And he's here also with my son, Gavin. Um, Joe is, a, you know, another really important mentor to me. And he, he took me on several collecting trips over to Burma. This is also known as Myanmar. And this was like the late 90s. And it was just an amazing, life-changing experience for me. So, you know, some of you know this, but Joe's life was cut short. And um, this was on the exact day that 9-11 happened. Um, you, you all know where you were. Um, Joe, as the, you know, those planes were going into the Twin Towers, Joe was over in Burma on a collecting trip. And he was uh, bitten by a crate. Uh, which is like a cobra relative. And in that illustration there, the crate is at the top. And then there is a, um, a crate mimic, which is called a wolf snake, 
which is the lower snake there. And you can see how much they look alike. Um, you know, I wanted to honor Joe and, um, you know, I ended up doing this illustration uh, many years later. And these are actually the same specimens that, you know, the, the crate there on the top is the same exact one that, that bit Joe. Um, you know, he was such an important mentor to me there. And, and there's a book um, called The Snake Charmer there at the bottom, uh, A Life and Death in Pursuit of Knowledge. So that book's all about Joe. And if you're interested in um, reading more about him, I think um, Riss is going to put some links at the end of the talk so that you guys can um, get to that. But it's a really good book about Joe. Um, so one day, you know, I'm at the Cal Academy, I'm working, and, and this guy walks in. This is Harry Green. And, you know, I remember, I knew who he was. Uh, and I just had never met him before. And um, I remember our first conversation there. He, you know, I was telling him that I wanted to transfer to Berkeley. I was at junior college. And I always remember what he said. He just he said, well, when you do, come see me and I'll be your advisor. And, you know, Harry's got these two really wonderful books I, I also want to recommend. Um, one is The uh, Snakes, The Evolution of Mystery and Nature. Um, it's packed full with really awesome photographs and really cool essays. Um, if you're into snakes or natural history in general, this is a great one. And also um, Tracks and Shadows, Field Biology as Art. And I, I love that title. You know, it's just, I was kind of riffing off of that title with the title of this talk. I loved it so much. So I ended up, you know, transferring to, to Berkeley and I went and saw Harry and, and he became my advisor. So I ended up taking also um, one of the courses that he co-taught and this is the natural history of the vertebrates. And here on the left, you can see Harry with us kids out at Corral Hollow, which is like east of Livermore. And he's got a baby rattlesnake there in the front. You can kind of see him. He's, you know, teaching us how to be around a rattlesnake and, and how to observe them, you know, safely for the snake and safely for us. So a few years ago, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the course, uh, which was started by Joseph Grinnell. Uh, there was like hundreds of former students that came from all over the country to attend the reunion. Um, it was really cool. I mean, you could really got a sense that this course affected a lot of people and myself included. So. Uh, for that event, I created this illustration and we made, um, we ended up making posters and some t-shirts out of it. So in this illustration, there's like 31 species and most of these, uh, there's a couple like a flying lizard and a flying snake up there in the, in the corner that aren't from California, but most of these are species that we would run into or learn about um, during this course. And there at the bottom center, uh, in the middle, kind of, you can see um, a pair of glasses, and those are Joseph Grinnell's glasses. So this is, I put in there sort of represent observation, which is key and core to natural history. And then also his old fountain pen there, which represented field notes. And, you know, he was quite famous for taking field notes and invented a whole system for taking notes in the field. So one time at Berkeley, I had one of my classes cancel. And so I go in to see Harry and see what, what I should do. And, and you know, Harry said, well, you, we could figure out another class for you to take. But he said, well, what about, would you be interested in helping me work on studying the diet of the California king snake? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course I would. So it didn't take me long to answer that. You know, we worked out some research credits and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I've always thought that good teachers turn you on to other good teachers. And, you know, Harry turned me on to the California king snake, which just turns out to be another great teacher because they eat so many different things. You know, it turns out it's, you know, it's difficult to study the diet of a, of a snake. You know, they're, they're, rarely encountered and they feed, you know, infrequently. So this is where museum specimens are really invaluable. So they're collected by natural history museums and the, the 
they're there for basically answering basic questions like, like what does the king snake eat? So what you have to do is, is dissect these specimens and you go into the stomach and usually one in 10 will have something inside. So you have to do a lot of dissections. So for this study, I did over 2,500 of them. And after that, you pull out the prey and you have to do this like CSI forensic kind of work to identify the prey. So that's where the king snake was such a good teacher. You know, like I had to learn all about the snakes and the lizards and the birds and the rodents that they, that they ate. You have to try to identify them. So this, this study ended up taking 20 years. Um, we published it in 2019. And if any of you are interested in reading it, um, you can Google king snake diet. It should come up. Um, you know, in the California king snakes, hopefully a lot of you have seen these, but they're famous for eating rattlesnakes. Like this one over here, this is a uh, king snake eating a mohawk house. King snakes are into the rattlesnake venom. So we were really surprised because we thought they would show up more often in the diet, but it turns out they don't eat them very often. But when they do, it's, it's a relatively massive and important prey. So that's why the rare prey matter. So one of the other um, things that we uh, described in this paper were three interesting behaviors that king snakes conduct while they're um, raiding bird nests. So they'll, they'll climb up trees and attack um, bird nests and eat the contents. So we had like videos of these behaviors from bird nest cameras, photos other biologists sent us, and field notes um, also. So, you know, trying to put all that together was difficult and um, felt like a good old school you know, illustration would kind of do the job here. So um, keep in mind that all three of these behaviors um, are, are happening um, while a king snake is, is in there raiding a bird nest. In each example, the king snake is eating either an egg or a nestling. But then at the same time, it's doing something with another part of its body. And all the time this is happening, the parent birds are usually mobbing the king snake. So they're, they're flying around it, trying to peck at it, and they're watching their babies get eaten. So they're, they're trying to do anything they can. So in A, the top left there, um, this is a behavior called egg displacement. And so while the king snake is eating an egg there, it's using a loop of another part of its body to actually pull an egg out of the nest and um, pull it away and, and eat it later. So in B, there's uh, body bridging. And what this is, is the snake is, you know, it's eating an egg or nestling, and then it's using part of its body as, as a protective shield from the mobbing parents. So while it's eating, it's kind of protecting itself at the same time. So it can quickly get these prey items down. And then in C is nest, nestling pinning. So this is specific for nestlings. Um, while it's eating one of those, it can, it can pin down other nestlings because they're mobile, right? So they can you know, jump out of the nest. It's called force fledging. So they'll do that if there's a snake in there trying to eat them all. But the king snake you know, can actually pin those down and, and eat them later. So one day I'm on the BART train heading into campus and I sit next to this guy on the train who's wearing this entomology shirt and it's got a praying mantis crawling up the Campanile Tower. And I'm like, hey man, nice shirt. And, you know, we start talking and, um, and it turns out his name is Sean, um, this guy's Sean O'Keefe. And he's a PhD student at Berkeley studying beetles. So as we get to talking, it turns out he needs illustrations of these beetles that he studies, um, which are these ant-like stone beetles called skidmenids. And these things are really tiny, like the, the size of ants, and they eat mites. They're very cool little beetles. So I meet up with Sean, and he puts me to work on the dissecting scope on campus, and I start drawing his beetles. And what he's doing is describing lots of species for his thesis. And it turns out a lot of the characters uh, to describe them are the genitalia. So I've always had friends who are like, you know, joking with me, you still drawing beetle dicks? And I'm like, yeah, I'm drawing beetle dicks, you know? But I mean, I paid my rent that way, which was pretty, pretty mind-blowing to me, you know? 
Sean um, was the first PhD student that, that I knew, and he really um, took me under his wing, and, and I really got to know through him how hard it is to, to actually get a PhD. So while I was working for Sean, um, you know, I'm working in there, and other entomologists would be coming by. They're, you know, curious, and um, they, before I know it, they started asking me for, for illustrations also. So, um, you know, it turned out drawing beetle dicks is like good experience for drawing moth dicks. So um, I started working for Jerry Powell and some of his students um, drawing um, this, these moth genitalia, which are on the left there. And they look like these crazy alien spaceships or something. So I, you know, I, I drew quite a few of these and um, on the right are some wing venation patterns of moths. Um, so I had my own little desk there at Wellman Hall and, and next to my desk uh, sat the postdoc. He's a physic entomologist. His name is Jeff Wells. And that's him there in the center in this cartoon. And Jeff was an expert in the identification of insects that would feed and breed on dead bodies. So Jeff had to go testify in court all the time, uh, murder cases and things like that. And he could tell you down to the hour when a person was killed based on the insect larvae that could be found in the body. So I made you know, a few illustrations for him, which included these anal tubercles found on a native and non-native species of blowfly maggot. So then this cartoon I made for him and, and Jeff's here in the middle, he's, he's the referee for these two um, maggots that are dueling it out. So another really important mentor of mine at the Essex Museum was Cheryl Barr. And Cheryl was the collections manager um, there at the Essex Museum. And also she studied these aquatic riffle beetles with her husband, Bill. And, you know, one of my biggest accomplishments as a scientific illustrator was having this illustration of one of Cheryl's newly described riffle beetles, um, which turned up on the cover of the Coleopter split. That was, that was really cool. Um, this fellow here on the, the top left is um, my artist friend, Bob Grumman. And he was my neighbor when I lived in Oakland. And Bob is another really important mentor of mine. He's an amazing painter and really a, like a total force of life. Um, Bruman is always telling me about his friend, David. He's, you know, I go see Bruman and say, ah, oh, you gotta, you gotta meet my friend, David. He likes animals like you do. He's into critters. And then, you know, sure enough, eventually one of Bruman's get togethers, I meet David and, and we totally hit it off. That's David there in the bottom, bottom left. And, you know, David eventually took me with him several times to Bali to meet his good pal, Wally Sagion. And that's the two of them down there. And they were both working on this book, Diving Bali, the underwater jewel of Southeast Asia. And so they asked me to do some illustrations for them. And one of these is this uh, panella, which is a really freaky, you know, parasitic copepod. So it's actually a crustacean. When you look at that thing, it doesn't look like a crustacean, but it's, it starts off as a planktonic critter. And then it ends up as this giant gnarly beast and it attaches itself to big pelagic critters like, you know, whales or marlin. And, um, you know, these three guys were like a funny mix of, of friend and mentor to me and continue to be. So literally like the day after I graduated, I started working full time for Joe Drennan on his frog crew at Ganda. And so from right to left in this picture is Joe Drennan, Carla Marlowe, uh, Ron Jackman, and then myself. So the foothill yellow-legged frog is the species we're interested in. And um, we're kind of like keeping track of the populations. And you can see there on the right, there's a foothill yellow-legged frog uh, next to an egg mass. And these egg masses are like the size of a baseball, something like that. And they lay them underwater uh, and they stick them to rocks usually. And each female lays one egg mass per year. So if you're monitoring populations, that's, that's really the best way to do it is go out and count egg masses. And you can see just below that egg mass, there is a, a pair of frogs mating there. This is called amplexus. And you got a female in the bottom and then the, um, 
larger, or excuse me, the smaller male rides on the back until the egg mass is laid. So we, we also keep track of individual frogs while we're out there. And you can do this by taking um, pictures of their chin. And so these photos down here are all one frog and each photo represents a different capture. And you can kind of quickly see that that pattern is the same. And it turns out that these patterns are just like our fingerprints. And you can use these patterns and uh, when you're doing a marker capture study, use those to learn about frogs movements and other things like longevity. Like we figured out that some of these frogs have lived at least 15 years um, from doing this kind of market capture work. So on the North Fork Feather River near Chico, um, the frogs live up in these tributaries, which is uh, this blue line here. And uh, the tributaries then feed into uh, the, the rivers. And this is the North Fork Feather there. And during the breeding season, they'll migrate to tributaries and then breed on these big cobble bars. Like down on the bottom right, you can see kind of a light colored area. That's a big cobble bar. And that's where we go and look for egg nests. So each of these dots represents a um, individual capture of the same individual frog. And we call this frog the Grand Dame of the North Fork Feather. So she's this female and we determined that she was at least 15 years old and she repeated the same pattern. So 2018, the campfire hit, you know, and this turned out to be one of the most destructive fires in California history. And you know, you can see just how massive it is. This is a satellite photo and on the right where the fire, the leading edge of it is right where our study sites are. Um, it burned up quite a bit of our study area. Uh, so we, we were able to go out there the following April. So this is what it looked like. Um, this is the lower reach and you can see it's pretty, and you know, there's some stuff coming back, but it's, it was pretty devastating out there. So this is a bar graph showing um, egg mass counts uh, for the past 20 years on the Po Reach, which is lower down, right above Lake Oroville. And we started here in 2002. So on the x-axis is the year, and then the y-axis is the number of egg masses. So you can see we're getting you know, higher numbers or like 150 um, counts of egg masses. And then each color here is like, um, represents a different site. And these sites are, you can almost think of them like subpopulations. So the campfire occurred where that red arrow is. And you know, one thing I really would like to impress upon you um, is the, it, really the importance of long-term monitoring. You, you know, you might expect that a fire like this would, would be really devastating, but you know, you can see in the years following that red arrow, egg mass numbers actually increased. But, you know, there might be a lag. Um, perhaps, you know, there'll be a lot of sediment that's gonna come down um, and cause a decline. You, we, don't, we don't know. I mean, the point is that's, that's why you need long-term data. And, you know, even decades worth like this. I mean, to really see, see trends out there. So then there's another reach, which is further upstream. It's called the Cresta Reach. And, and notice here for the Po, uh, the y-axis, how many egg masses we have up there. When you go upstream into the Cresta Reach, you're starting to deal with numbers, you know, around a dozen or less. Um, initially, when we got up there in 2002, we, we had, you know, upwards of 25 to 30 egg masses. And, um, we documented a, de a decline in that period, which were caused by these recreational flows, um, where on the weekends, the, the flows were turned up for kayakers and rafters. And then this happened right during the breeding season and egg masses were getting scoured by the higher flows. So later, um, you know, you can kind of see the, the green there starts to pitter out and really the red um, subpopulation, that site six is barely hanging on. So we have, um, there on the blue, like that's, that's like our main site where the frogs are persisting, but really no, low numbers still. So we were finally given the green light to do some active management and we began working with the Oakland Zoo. So what we did is we brought uh, tadpoles from the Crest Reach um, to the zoo and then they reared them in their tanks and raised them into adult frogs. And then we've been releasing those. 
So the first releases occurred in 2020, and we're kind of waiting to see if this has a positive effect on the population up there. It's a little early to know that yet, but we're hoping to bolster them a little bit and get this diversity back in numbers. So this is Margaret Rooster, who uh, pioneered captive rearing of the foothill leg frogs, and she figured out how to do it all. Um, and she was the first to do it. Um, and yeah, in 2020, it was the first um, release of zoo raised foothill year legged frogs ever. So that was exciting. So on the right, there's an illustration I did of our first frog um, on the crest of reach. We started a mark recapture study in 2004, and this was M1. He's like the first male. So you can see that uh, his front arm, the one that's furthest away from us, you can see on his thumb there is a little black bump. And that's a, a nuptial pad. And that's how you can tell the males from the females. And they use those little pads to grip the females when they're on top of them. So, you know, I always really like the, like the surface texture of these frogs and the bumpy, they have all these cool patterns on them. I thought it would be, you know, be really challenging and fun to, to try to draw one of these. So one of the other critters that we study on the Feather River is the Sierra garter snake. And for the past 20 years, um, while we're doing our frog surveys, we also see lots of these snakes and they eat fish and frogs. So back in 2004, we were doing a radio telemetry uh, study tracking the frog movements. And we're tracking this one frog and this female and in that upper left uh, picture, we get a signal coming from the snake, you know, and I at first got to it, I'm really confused and like, Where's the frog at? And then, you know, you look, you look there and you can see a really big bulge inside of that snake where the skin's, the skin's kind of expanded there. And then we kind of, uh-oh, you know, you, you get the snake and um, we ended up, um, it, it regurgitated this female frog there on the, the right-hand side, that picture. And you could see the little radio there with the little waist belt that we put on the frog. And then just to the left of that, you can see some of the eggs. Um, so that was a gravid female frog that, that this snake ate. And, and this snake was actually also gravid. And they're a live bearing species of snake. So as it turns out, you know, just, just like with the California king snake, you know, the, the adult frogs are like a rare prey item in terms of our frequency, but they're the most important prey in terms of biomass for these snakes. So this is especially true, I think, for these gravid female snakes. You know, if, if she can get a hold of one of these gravid female frogs, it's like a huge caloric payoff. And, you know, I think it means that her babies are more likely to survive. So these are very smart snakes. There's a, that bottom picture the, is a, a Sierra Gar snake eating a trout. Sometimes they'll carry them out under the bank of the creek to eat them. So this is a little video I'm just gonna show you is um, basically how the other way that you can figure out how to figure out what snakes eat in the wild. You know, museum specimens is one way, but you can go out there and catch snakes and then you can, this is called palping. So this is kind of what it looks like. So um, that was kind of a, that was a train in the background, that humming noise. But this, this fish here um, is called a hardhead. And, you know, after we do this, we take uh, measurements of, of the snake and the prey, and then you also weigh them. And it turns out this little fish was 33% of the body mass of the snake. You know, think about that for a second. Like, you know, for me, that would be like me eating a 60 pound hamburger. Like, without you know, hands or any kind of utensils, just eating it whole. That's pretty, pretty amazing what these snakes can do. So, all right, you, you may have been wondering, you know, what the heck is a psychedelic bioscape? So back in 1999, um, one of our collecting trips to Burma with Joe Slowinski and Cal Academy, I caught uh, cerebral malaria. This is also called falciparum malaria. 
And, you know, it's a deadly protozoan that's transmitted through female mosquitoes. So this type of malaria is, is really deadly. It causes um, really high fever and the protozoan goes in there and ruptures your red blood cells. And then it can severely clog capillaries in your brain. You also get these, you know, really bad chills and fever, really high fever, and get these really painful headaches. At least I did. I mean, it felt like getting stabbed in the head with a hot knife like every five minutes. It was excruciating. And, you know, it was during some of these fever bouts, they're like fever dreams um, kind of a thing. I know all of you have had, you know, fever dreams. And um, this was similar to that, but it just felt a lot stronger. And um, I saw these, I was seeing all these like visions and it was, um, they're like black and white, like really psychedelic. And they're like these biological organic forms. And it was, it just felt like a, like a lifetime's worth of inspiration like hitting me like a lightning bolt. I mean, it just all was right there. And so when I was recovering, I, you know, I got to work and um, I used charcoal and I was trying to like carve out some of these landscapes I was seeing in my mind. And this one's called Falciprum, which I finished in 2000. And, you know, a funny thing about this is I, um, I later read, you know, probably 15 years later, um, Alfred Russell Wallace, he, you know, he also had falciparum malaria. And it's funny because when, you know, he was talking about while he was dealing with it, having these fever dreams and that, I, I mean, he, he was like envisioning the mechanism for evolution, like natural selection. Like he was tripping out with these fever dreams and, and had visions of how this kind of stuff worked. So um, I don't recommend, you know, getting, malaria for inspiration. There's other ways to do it, but um, this is another piece um, I finished in 2003. This is called Prana. And this is, you know, 2003, it's post 9-11. Um, you know, you can see a reference to the Twin Towers there on the right side. It's, it's reflected in the water, but it's not on the landscape. Um, you have these really old ancient entities that are kind of emerging from this black oily water. And they're sort of praying and um, hoping we'll make it through this, this period. We're, you know, we're about to invade Iraq. And one of my brothers was over there in the Marine Corps, um, part of the invasion. Um, there's a vague you know, rest, reference to the Middle East there with the pyramids. And there's these silhouettes in the water, um, not reflected in the landscape of these human faces. So these are two pieces I also worked on. Um, both a, a female on the left and a male entity on the right. Um, the female one on the left um, of natural history, um, we're all into natural history, you know, but um, I actually took this name from the, um, an album title of one of my favorite bands called Sleepy Time Gorilla Music. And then on the right, the Sentinels, um, they're like these guardians, you know, of this little universe I'm trying to visualize. So these are these these two. I was getting a little. I felt like a little closer to what I was seeing um, when I had malaria. And what I would do is like cover a whole piece of paper with charcoal, and then I would wipe it away and start um, creating the forms. So I wanted to play you this short video. Um, it's about three minutes long, and um, it's. Um, what I'm trying to do is really kind of get you into the vibe of, of this world I'm trying to describe. And the music is by this really uh, wonderful band called Will Nofio. And it's headed by this guy, uh, Steve Perry. Yeah, we go.
So this is Sabio. He's a Shuar shaman from Ecuador. And the Shuar are sort of famous for their old practice of head shrinking. And these guys were never conquered by the Spanish. Um, my friend John and I uh, traveled down to Ecuador, which is, it's like por portion of the upper Amazon um, a few years ago. And we spent a week with Sabio. His father and grandfather were also shamans, and he learned how to, you know, how to make ayahuasca, which is a potent psychedelic brew used for spiritual and healing ceremonies. He learned that from his father and his grandfather. So each tribe in the Amazon sort of has their own version of the brew, um, but there's always two main ingredients. And one of those is a hallucinogenic plant called Psychotria viridis uh, contains DMT, which is the active component. And then there's the bark of this vine. It's called vine of the soul, uh, Banisteriopsis capi. And it's the bark of the vine that you use. And they um, sort of create this big um, boiled brew um, with other, other additives to it, but always these two plants. And the, the vine basically inhibits your body's ability to metabolize the DMT. So it stays, it's basically orally active at that point. If you were to eat that psychotroia plant by itself, you wouldn't, you wouldn't notice anything, It'd have no effect on it. So I mean, you, you talk about natural history and I, I mean, I'm just, I'm still amazed that, you know, in a place where you have a rainforest full of plants, how many thousands of species um, all coexisting together, all the different combinations of plants you could possibly put in a pot. And, you know, there's humans have been down there for, you know, 15,000 years maybe, and they figured out that this combination of plants works. And I, I just think that's, that's, to me, amazing, you know, and um, Sabio and his ancestors, they just lived and breathed natural history. They still do. So John and I ended up taking ayahuasca with Sabio three different times over a week. And, you know, I'm giving you like the cliff, cliff notes version here, but it was, you know, I feel very transformative. It was, it was harrowing. It was also really terrifying. Um, it's not something I would recommend to anybody, but it was also incredibly inspirational. Um, and it was, it's like a, for me, an otherworldly experience, um, something like, you know, like experience like a prolonged lucid dream. And Sabio was right there with us, you know, guiding us the whole way through. So after I got home from this trip, I got to work on, on this piece. And this is called Carbon Day. Um, you know, and my, my father passed a few years before we went down to Ecuador and, and I had, you know, death in my mind, um, pretty, pretty heavy. And um, I knew I was going to be working on a death piece, but, um, it, you know, it be, ended up becoming like a symbol and like, like personally and also like on a species level for like our species, Homo sapiens. So the main theme of this piece is climate change. And, you know, it's really a reflection about our use of fossil fuels. So, you know, fossil fuels aren't inherently bad or anything. Um, I mean, you look around, everything that we see in our society, everything that we use, the, these computers that we're looking on right now that we're using to communicate are all here because of fossil fuels, you know? So we have a lot to be grateful for. We've created a whole society on it. But what are fossil fuels? Like, well, you know, we go to the gas pump and, you know, we turn on our heat, things like that. But wh what is this stuff? We take it for granted, you know, there's, there's, they're all really just ancient sunlight trapped in carbon from millions of years ago that we, we combust for energy. And there's, there's two main forms of it, right? So you have oil from the oceans and coal from the land. Oil was created in the ocean and, and coal from the land. So oil, when you get down to it, it's, it's really just fossilized plankton from millions of years ago. So the plankton, you know, absorbed the sunlight by photosynthesis, and then when they died, they dropped to the bottom of the ocean and become part of the fossil, um, you know, basically the marine layer down there. 
and they take with them that stored sunlight. So that's what we drill up and we burn for energy. You know, you can see all the different types there at the bottom of the picture, all the different types of microfossils that make up petroleum. And they're oozing out of this human skeleton. He's, he's basically gorged himself on it. And this is like, you know, J.D. Rockefeller's skeleton here. You know, and, and above his head is, is a sort of crown. And that's, that's what's called a coccolith. And coccolith is, is a planktonic um, unicellular algae. It turns out to be a really, really important um, organism in the ocean that, that uptakes carbon. So coal, when you get down to it, you know, it's, it's, it's fossilized plant material from the land. So, you know, 300 million years ago, it's the Carboniferous period. And we had tons of these big trees they're not really trees, they're like these huge club mosses, basically. And there's, there were two kind of common types back then. Um, and this is what's on fire in the background, this forest. Uh, Sigillaria, which is, there are those, those funny little Y-shaped uh, trees. And then you have uh, Lepidodendron, which are the taller, straighter um, trees. Uh, they're also called scale trees. Um, and I'm kind of riffing on, uh, you know, like the black smokers from the deep sea vents. And, you know, we burn this coal and it releases the energy into the, um, into the atmosphere. You know, it releases that carbon, we get our energy, and then that's what's, you know, obviously warms our atmosphere up. So there's also, you know, a reference here to uh, the Greek myth of Orion. So up in the sky above the coccolith crown there, uh, on the left is Scorpio, and then on the right is Orion. Uh, and you can also see on his hand there on his chest is a scorpion, and that's the, that's the scorpion there that killed him. And he's, you know, he's clutching his dollars even as a dead man there. Check out the story of Orion and get a chance. It's interesting. So, um, you know, down in the, the lower part, there's this ball of energy there. It's representing technology, maybe fusion or just any kind of any kind of technology. And there's, you know, other ways to get our energy. It was just, you know, it was in this guy's hand the whole time. He just chose to use fossil fuels for the power and the wealth that it gave him. So when I finished this piece, I ended up making a frame for it. And I had these old, um, you know, real fossils that I was using, I ordered. Um, and there's lipidodendron and sigillaria fossils um, in this frame. So I was able to cast these fossils and then I sculpted them together. And this was for a show called Ecocentric at Blue Line Arts um, in Sacramento. So I learned how to do all this casting and sculpting from a new mentor of mine, this fellow here, Chet Zar. And Chet used to work uh, as a special effects guy in Hollywood making movies. So he knew exactly how I can like carbon death. It was like I had in my head and he knew exactly how I could see it through. So he helped me with that. You know, Chet's also a really awesome oil painter. And you can see here um, is one of his paintings called the schismatic. He's also teaching me how to oil paint. And, you know, I'm trying to explore a way of working a little faster. You know, I, I've been working with charcoals and some of these pieces take me years to finish. And I've been trying to, you know, describe this universe, but I, I'd like to work a little quicker if I can. Um, and these are a few of my, my recent ones. And these, are, these are oil paintings that are created in one pass. So I'm creating it, you know, in one night basically and trying to move a little faster and um, keeps things a little more immediate and a little more intuitive. I've been having fun doing this. So, I'd like to close um, you know, with this quote by Dave Wake. He was a herpetologist and an evolutionary biologist at Berkeley. And I, I would like to point out also this illustration to his right uh, by my friend Ben Witzke. And he's also um, part of the show at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. Um, and this is a brand new species of slender salamander from California, it's just described and it's named after Dave Wake in his honor. This is uh, Batricoceps wakei. You know, I, I think this quote is really great and it gets 
you know, to me, it's like the core of what natural history is, is curiosity. I mean, that's where it all starts to me. So what he says is, I'm a great believer in the value of curiosity. Whatever you can do to encourage curiosity in young people is great. I think the antonym of curiosity is cynicism. And somehow I think that's that what we've done as a society is make that important somehow. So um, I will leave you with that. And um, I thank you all for your time and, and showing up for this. And um, I will turn it back over to you, Marissa. Thank you, Kevin. Sure. Um, what a thought provoking quote to, to end on. Um, I do wanna invite our folks joining us tonight. If you have any questions for Kevin, please put them in the in the comments. We're a little past seven, but we'll, we'll stick around for a little while longer um, and make sure that we have time to address your, your thoughts and questions out there. Um, I was also very inspired by how respectfully you spoke about all of your mentors over the years. Um, I really appreciated that from you know, the people who first inspired you when you were young to, you know, every step of the way. Um, it was really wonderful to, um, to get them to meet them um, through this presentation. And I also thought it might be nice, as you, as you mentioned at the start, for us all to consider our mentors over the years. If, um, if anyone joining us wants to write the name of a mentor that means something to them in the, in the chat, we'd love to see that um, and any notes about uh, what they mean to you, I'd um, welcome you to do that. Um, and someone asked if this will be recorded and posted, and yes, it will. It's recording right now, and um, the moment that I can get it up on YouTube, I will send a link to everyone who registered um, tonight. And uh, one thing I wanted to point out, Kevin, is that you said that you started working at Cal Academy because you started volunteering there. Is that what mm -hmm. I heard? Yeah. Um, I also appreciate that you, you know, you started off at community college and then transferred to Berkeley. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that, about this, you know, this path that you've taken and um, any advice that you might have for people who are um, trying to find their way. Yeah, I think, um, you know, volunteering is a really great way to start um, doing that. Um, it's hard to find jobs in natural history and um you know but you can always you know volunteering is i just feel like a really great way and i i think i volunteered at cal academy for you know three years or something like that before i was able to find any actual work there so i mean it's all part of um you know learning and you just gotta you know get out there and there's always like connections you know you make connections as you go along and um it's, it, it almost feels more like service or something like that, you know, and, um, but I would say, yeah, if you're, if you're up and coming, you're like, you know, starting college and stuff like that, just go volunteer at the place that you're, whatever kind of stuff you're into, just, you know, find it and, and volunteer there. Yeah, I, I bring it up because I, I started volunteering at the museum where I now work and I value it a lot. Yeah. Um, and I think yeah. it's great to to share those stories out um, with people. And I, I didn't have a background in natural history, but I got hooked from that experience. So I think there's a lot to mm -hmm. be said about that. Um, and we did have some questions that have come in. So Dee is curious about your psychedelic experiences um, and how they informed your study of the creatures um, that you focus on in your field biology. Is there any um, connection there now? I don't, let's see. Um... I don't know if there's any direct um, link between sort of psychedelic experiences and the animals that I work on. You know, I think um, I think they're almost two separate things, but they do inform. I mean, there is a crossover there. I, I mean, it's 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 a little more subtle though. It's not like um, uh, I was working on frogs and then I, you know, got interested in, in psychedelics or something like that. Mm -hmm. I do remember Mr. Carlson, he gave me one time, a, I was sitting in class and he passed me this little clip from the paper, but it was like about psychedelic toads and he knew I was into, you know, herps and stuff. So he, he passed mm -hmm. this little cutout to me and I, you know, I kept it. I still have it. And, um, 
you know, I, I think, yeah, I don't really have a direct link though between those two things, but yeah. they, do, well, I, they do inform each other. Yeah, I appreciate that you're, um, that this presentation is very much like, it seems kind of holistic to me and just very interconnected. And I appreciate that, you know, it's not just about this one area of your work where we're full people with full experiences and all these different interests and it's all connected. And so I, I really enjoyed um, seeing how your interests take you in different places and how your life experiences have taken you to different places too. And that your art is not just in service of your um, field of study too. It's, it's so much more. So I appreciated that. Um, we had some other thoughts come in. So from uh, Chris, Curious whether you find yourself more compelled by producing art or by uncovering the mysteries of nature at this moment. Mm. That is a tough one. Wait, like, uh, do I like one more than the other? Um, potentially curious whether you find yourself more compelled by producing art. So like that's the driving force or by uncovering the mysteries of nature at this moment. So maybe like in, the, I, I think this might be more focused on like the practice of of art and science illustration, what's the driving force of creating something that is art or in, um, you know, finding meaning through the process? Yeah, that's a hard one to answer. I think it's all really, for me, it's like interwoven like really deeply. So it's it's hard to, I think there's a time aspect though that, you know, I, I, I do find myself wishing I had more time to, to, to make art. Mm -hmm. that's, that's probably one, you know, thing I would, would add to that, but um, yeah, I mean, I mean, they're really all, it's been very deeply interwoven in my life, so. You mentioned at one point um, that drawing beetle genitalia paid the bills um, yeah. for a while there. Is that like, all, you know, is it is it still that way for you now where it's balancing like when to do a science illustration commission versus when to do field work? Or was that more like, was science illustration really the thing that kept you going so that you could do the field work at a certain time in your life? I think they they happened at different points in my life. So so I was working at the Essig Museum when I was an undergraduate. So um, that was going on in it, you know, in it, in it, there was a lot of work there because I was on campus, you know, so I, I met a lot more people that needed that kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, nowadays, like I've, I've been working on this frog crew for the last 20 years. So it pretty much, I mean, it's, it's like full time. And um, so the but I do like to, you know, I always like to keep like my pen moving, you know, but try to do something every year or something and, and uh, try to keep that going. And also trying to, to work on this, this um, more of the psychedelic stuff that I'm, that I'm into. And um, that stuff is pulling me quite a bit. You know, mm -hmm. I really feel the clock ticking in, in some ways. Like I want to describe that universe more you know mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just I feel like I'm just scratching the surface and I want to show everybody more you know basically so definitely um someone uh had a question about your science illustration background and you spoke a lot about um uh, the courses that you took at Berkeley and like your, your early work um with your art class like in in high school but did you take a specific um, science illustration course during your I, time? Yeah, I never did. Um, I wanted to though. There's, you know, the, there was the science, scientific illustration uh, masters at Santa Cruz and I, I was seriously considering applying for that. And I know it moved to Monterey now, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it just um, basically, you know, I, I, I had to work and, you know, I was, um, you know, single dad for quite a while and I just had, I had to to work so it kind of like the timing was was off you know so I just pretty much um had to do it on the side when I could and you know that's but I, I wish I would still love to, to do that you know if I could yeah there's a, yeah there is a program at CSUMB that was at UC Santa Cruz which is now there and I know they're having like a summer um series that's just open to the public too so I'll include a link to that for people if if there are other folks out there who um, would also like to take a, a course in science illustration. Um, they're, they're out there. Um, it's fun and, stuff. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And I just really quick before I'll, I'll let you go and I'll let everyone go, but I did have like one specific question about, um, the snake series with the eggs. Mm -hmm. Um, and just, well, not so much about that in particular, but I was just so fascinated by like depicting the behavior 
as opposed to what followed was the, the beetle genitalia, which was very much like an anatomical, um, like, you know, trying to get very detailed to like what it actually is uh -huh. um, for identification. And do you um, find that you're like more drawn to one or the other, or is there, are there challenges um, with one over the other? I know with the king snake, you were talking about like, you know, your, the, the work that you were doing for that professor was um, dissecting uh, collections specimens because it's so hard to observe it in nature, but that behavior must have been observed, right? Yeah, I mean, it was, I think, you know, like you said, there's, there, there are two different things. Like you're, you're drawing like anatomical structures for basically like for species descriptions. Mm -hmm. So you, you want to be really clear and then you're trying to decide what parts to keep out because you want you're trying to show the characters that are important to, to describe the species. Mm -hmm. And then something like, yeah, with that king snake illustration, it's that one that, you know, there's, there's more artistic license in there because we were trying to, you know, our source material for that was like, you know, people putting bird nest cameras in and so they're they're monitoring their birds and then um for that kind of a study you know to monitor nest success and stuff like that but then you get these these snakes will come in and raid the nests and you'll get this footage of i mean they're really incredible these snakes will come in and just you know take out the whole nest and you have the parents right there mobbing and so you know we we saw videos of that where these the snakes are throwing up these body coils protecting themselves from the birds and there were also like field notes like at, at, at Berkeley in the um, Grinnell Library. There's all these field notes that you can go through in there, like, like from the 30s, 20s. I mean, you go back and, and some of these, deep, these field notes are just beautiful. Like you, they're really descriptive and you can actually pull this data right out of the field notes. Wow. And so there were descriptions of exactly what we illustrated. And then there's also, you know, there were like published records of stuff like this. So. It was like, how, how do you put all that together? And you can write about it, but it's like this, you know, I wanted to make like an illustration to really kind of show it, you know, cause we couldn't, it was hard to patch all that together. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's amazing that we're seeing it for, from these cameras that were, you know, set up for something completely different. That must've been so shocking yeah. for those people who wanted to watch these nests <laughs> yeah. um, thrive. Yeah. Uh, wow. So crazy cool. Um, well, I guess I'll, I have some other thoughts, but I'll let it go now because we're at 718 and it's time. Um, well, thank you so much, Kevin. And as we've been mentioning, uh, the Art of Nature, it's up at the museum through June uh, 5th. Um, so if you do live in the area, please do make a visit to Santa Cruz to the museum to see it. We have free admission on first Fridays and on every Saturday in May. Um, and it's uh, it's a beautiful show. We do it every year, but it's different every year because it's different artists, it's different pieces from these artists, and uh, the diversity that's on display is really just unbelievable. So I hope you all have a chance to see it. I'll also share a link to the virtual exhibit. So if you aren't able to come visit the museum um, before the show ends, you can still um, see it online. And uh, will there be a closing reception? There will be a first Friday event. So uh, not this Friday, but next Friday, it'll be free admission all day long. And then from five to eight, a number of the artists from the show are going to be outside um, with kind of like a maker's market and we'll have a little party. So that's sort of our closing reception if you want to um, come for that. And I will be in touch with everyone with a follow-up email with links to resources and a link to the recording. And Kevin, do you want to leave us with any parting thoughts? Uh, go check out the show if you can. And, um, you know, uh, museum you can support you know with donations or um, you know membership even something like that and um, go go hike this weekend yeah definitely see if you can spot a snake or a frog or something yeah. um, okay great thank you so much Kevin thank you everyone have a good night appreciate everyone showing up thank you bye